content to cover. I'm going to try to cram about two, three hours worth of content into one hour. Does that sound good? We'll see how we can do. Oh, yeah, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, just plug it in somewhere and... I don't know how that thing works, but... Yeah, thank you. Uh, Charles, where'd you go? Oh, here. Uh, what time do we need to have a hard stop? 4.30. 430 hard stop. Hard okay, stop. good. So what I'll try to do is I'll try to go through as much of the content as I can and then leave a little bit of time at the end to answer questions because I know, uh, especially when it comes to this topic in particular, there's, there's a lot of questions and a lot that were, had already come in but we hadn't gotten to. So let's see, if I, can, if I can try to finish this off by like 4 o'clock, then we'll take some time for questions. Um, but because of the nature of it, we're probably not going to do a whole lot of prayer time about this particular thing. Um, so uh, what I'm going to cover in this session is I want to talk about, um, well, deliverance ministry in, in, or, or freedom ministry or whatever the palatable term is. I'm not really sure uh, what's best for most people in North Carolina. Uh, and, and where I live in Denver, this kind of stuff is actually not all that crazy out there, um, but it's because we have a lot of, you know, witchcraft and Satanism and things like that that take place where I live. So uh, it's not uncommon to find, you know, pastors who get targeted by covens and, you know, show up in, out the front door and see, you know, ritual totems done or animals sacrificed on their lawn and things like that. So um, not that that's common in other places. I have no idea what it's like here. It's not much. So you got some of it, but not much. It's pretty common where I live. Um, so all that to say, we're going to talk about uh, the enemy and uh, how the enemy gets a grip in our lives and what's the, how does his power work, but then more significantly, and, and uh, how does the power of God work to dispel the power of the enemy? How is God destroying the works of the enemy? And so that's kind of what I want to cover. I'm going to pray real quick before we dive into the topic, and then I'm going to deal with a little bit of misconceptions, which will probably help answer some of the questions you guys already have, and then I'll go into some, some, some of the content on uh, how a person gets demonized to begin with. So, uh, Lord Jesus, we recognize that you are sovereign over all creation, that every being out there that's evil and afflicted, or uh, that seeks to afflict us, is just a, a lesser being, that you are the power uh, of all powers, um, the God of gods, and that you're greater and sovereign over all of creation. So we ask that you would oversee this time, that you would um, bring great comfort and great uh, insight into how to destroy the works of the enemy. Uh, we ask for your guidance in this, um, in this session. Thank you for everything you've given us. We love you, Lord Jesus. Amen. So before we dive into the basic category, uh, topic, I want to cover the misconception ab about um, demonic possession. Um, so often when people talk about this, they, they tend to fall on two different errors or two different ditches. If you can uh, imagine a, a road where there's a ditch on either side, we want to walk along the road. We don't want to fall into the ditches. So one of the areas or misconceptions that people have is where they tend to overinflate the power of the enemy. Like, uh, I know that down in Texas, where I used to live, people didn't want to talk about it. Don't mention the word demon, don't mention the name Satan, don't mention any of those things, because there's this overinflated sense that the enemy, if you just talk about it, then something's going to happen to you. Um, and then you also see charismatics on the other side of it, like there's some people who won't even talk about it, then there's the, the overly charismatic who seem to see uh, a demon behind every door, right? Everything, oh, I'm just under spiritual warfare, brother. Well, no kidding, you live in a world torn at war. You're always in spiritual warfare, but when you make everything about a spirit, then you usually fail to take responsibility for stuff in your life, right? So we don't want to do that, where we overinflate the power of the enemy. Um, the other thing we don't want to do is to talk about the enemy as though he doesn't exist. It has no, and this is sort of a, an enlightenment or rationalistic perspective, where the enemy doesn't really have any impact on the world. Yeah, sure, it happens in places like China or, or things like that, but nothing here in the United States. Both of those would actually be errors, and the scriptures don't talk about that. You ever wonder why you see very little activity, uh, demonic activity in the Old Testament, but then suddenly in the New Testament, it seems like, you know, demons are manifesting all over the Gospels and Acts. Everything that was weird, like why that disparity? Why suddenly is there uh, uh, demonic um, beings suddenly 
being made known in the New Testament. Was uh, John, you know, the, the light of the world has come, and the world did not comprehend it, but it also exposed what was in darkness. That's what light does. And so uh, it actually makes sense that in our day, and at, since the days of Jesus, that we would see a whole lot more of the enemy's works being exposed than they did in the Old Testament, because Jesus has come. He's bound the strong man. He's now given the Spirit, and in us is light, right? We are now the light of the world. What does light do? It exposes what's in darkness. So it makes sense that with believers come the end of the oppression of the enemy. Um, now, another thing that's a major misconception is when we talk about, it happens to do with the terminology we use. Now, when you read the scriptures and you see somebody who's oppressed by the enemy, what's the word most often used? Possessed. Now, when I use the word possession, what movie is immediately conjured to mind? Exorcist. Do you really want to get your demonology from Hollywood? Is that a good place to start? Not really. And, and again, it falls into one of those errors of overinflating the power of the enemy because at the end of that movie, who actually wins? And that's not the truth, is it? Matter of fact, we're right now, we're sort of living in a war, but we're on the other end of that war. It's like when the American troops uh, entered into the war, like there's this famous battle called D-Day, World War II. Uh, my, my grandfather fought in, in World War II. He flew five missions in World War II, was shot down, uh, got the Purple Heart, a number of different stories that come from that. He was also a Jewish man, which is kind of an interesting thing, and he liberated Buchenwald which is one of the, probably the second worst concentration camp and saw the Holocaust firsthand. But uh, on D-Day in particular, they would say that that was a decisive day for that war because after D-Day, when the American troops uh, gained a foothold in Western Europe, they began to make their advance on the enemy territory. The war was sort of decided on that one day when the Americans managed to gain a foothold in Western Europe. But there were still a ton of casualties after the fact, Right? Same thing is true for us today. We live on the other side of the crucifixion and resurrection. Jesus, the Lord over all, is now seated on a throne in heaven. But don't you find it interesting that even after that, in 1 John, John will say, we know that we are of God, but that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. That's a weird thing, isn't it? The whole world lies in the power of the evil one, yet Jesus is ascended and on a throne, a place from which he rules. And so decisive victory has happened. The war has actually been won, but we're still fighting the battles till the war is over completely. That makes sense? You following me on this? So uh, the word possession, because of the way that we define that and how most of us have gotten our demonology from Hollywood, probably not the best word to use. Um, the Greek word just simply uh, means to have a demon or be affected by a demon. So when we want to take a, uh, a noun and make it a verb, what do, we, what do we do to a word? Like if I was going to say, um, uh, if I want to make the word theology into a verb, what would I do to it? Right, you had I-Z-E, theologize, right? That's the same thing you can do with Greek. And it's actually, that's exactly what they've done. They've just taken the word demon and, and added a little uh, extra I-Z-E to the end of it. And so it's, uh, I mean, it's not a really an I-Z-E in Greek, but it's the same thing that uh, when you translate it to English, it just means demonize. Now, does demonize mean uh, exorcist, like level 10, you're, you're, you know, your whole, you're just a meat puppet for a demon, right? That's not what it means in the scripture. You don't find that most often. Um, so I'm going to use, I'm going to just say, just suggest to all of you, remove the word possession from your vocabulary. Use instead the word demonize. And then when you think of it, think about it uh, in regards to its level of influence, and so I, what I do is I write up here a, a scale from 0 to 10. Now, when you think in the Bible of a person who's level 10 demonized, I'm gonna, who do you think of? Legion, right? Yeah, Legion's demons have demons of their own. That's how demonized Legion was, correct? So that'd be like level 10. And then 0, no demonization. Right, yeah, it says, uh, you know, the devil has nothing in me, right? But I got a question for you. Was, de was Jesus ever harassed by the devil? 
So on some level, he experienced some demonization, right? How about the uh, temptation? Was he being tempted with something he didn't want? Or was the temptation a strong one? Yeah. I mean, you think about it. He, he'd been hungry, had no food, no water. What was the devil tempting him with? Right. Right, so it was actually, it was a real temptation, something he really wanted. So on some level, he's being harassed, he's being demonized. Uh, now, granted, whether it's in a person or on a person, well, the Bible's not super clear about that, right? It just says demonized. That's it. That's the word that's used every single time when it talks about uh, an evil spirit. Um, so then you could think of like maybe a, a temptation that you really have, but that's kind of easily dismissible would be like level one demonized. And that's kind of the way we want to think of it as on a continuum of, of how much influence is this evil spirit have over a person. We all good on that? All right, I know there's going to be questions coming up on that one later, so don't worry, we'll get to it. Um, uh, the, the tough part about dealing with an evil spirit is you don't always realize that's what you're dealing with. And I say this because I myself was demonized from probably the age of four until I was around 30 years old. Now, let me give you some background for this. When I was uh, a year old, my parents divorced. My dad was not the greatest of guys. He didn't pay child support. And then when I was four years old, he married another woman who had six kids. Meanwhile, he couldn't pay child support for his own kids. So then he adopted her kids and then had two more kids. So as you can imagine, as a four-year-old, What's the message being sent to that four-year-old whose dad has now married another woman with six kids and can't afford to take care of his own kids? Right, I'm not worth sticking around for. And so you might as well have branded me with the word abandonment or rejection on my forehead. And I carried that wounding into my life, into my adult life, sabotaging almost every relationship that I would get into. So that journal I created called the Overcomer's Journal that was actually birthed out of the process that I went through to get free from the spirit of rejection and abandonment. I had this problem of anytime I would get close to a woman uh, that I was going to get closer to marriage, um, I would begin to smother her. And I would think, if she, if the closer we get, the more she's going to find out that I'm not worth sticking around for. And so I always oscillated in a relationship from either rejecting the person who loved me and wanted to be with me, because I thought if she really loves me, something must be wrong with her, uh, and then chasing after the one who is walking away, right? Because if I can get the one walking away, that means I'm actually worth something. How many of you know that's a recipe to always be single? Go after the one walking away, never going to get it. If they suddenly do suddenly like you, well, there must be something wrong with them, right? That's actually a demonic way of thinking. And the thing was, I didn't realize that I was living with an evil spirit. I had been living with it for so long, I didn't know the difference between my thoughts and its thoughts. Uh, my feelings and its feelings. And that's the toughest part about uh, a uh, lie of the enemy or something called a stronghold of the mind is usually you think it's just you because it feels true. That's the worst part about the, the lies we believe is that they feel true. And the truth doesn't always feel true. And so I'm going to get into that hopefully at the very end, but I want to talk more uh, about some of the more direct ways that demons influence us and not necessarily the ways they get entwined in our personality, uh, but I want to cover both of those things. I always say there's two ways to deal with a demonic spirit. There's power. And when there's power present, you'll see these things leave with a scream, and it's violent. Because the kingdom of heaven is literally invading earth, and it's, it's, there's a, a confrontation between the power of God and the power of en the enemy. And when, uh, especially when there's power, these things will scream, because it's like something that a person had been li living with for a long period of time is suddenly being stripped violently from their personality. So there's power present, and those things go. They go violently. Um, but when there's not power present, there's still a way to deal with it, and I would call, call it starving it out. That means removing every reason for why that devil has a, a reason to be there. So in my case, I had to deal with all the stinking thinking that I had, 
all the lies that I had believed that the, the enemy had sort of latched onto, and, and I was giving it room in my life. Now, some of you are going, but, but hold on a second. You know, th- this is really a conversation for those who aren't Christians, right? Well, no, I, I, I became a Christian when I was 15 years old, and I lived with an evil spirit until I was 30. And some of you go, well, well, where's that in the Bible? Well, let's talk about it. Give me one verse that explicitly tells you that a Christian cannot be demonized. You won't find one. Closest we come to it is maybe in John where he says, you know, hey, light cannot dwell where there's, or darkness cannot dwell where their light is, right? But that's not explicitly stating that an enemy can't be there. If anything, I actually find scriptural precedent for believers being demonized and harassed by the enemy. Again, most of us, when we think, uh, possessed or demonized, we're thinking level 10. I just told you that's not an accurate way of looking at things. You've got to think about it on a spectrum, right? Um, So let me give you some examples. Uh, We see in, hmm, Luke chapter 13, we see a woman who's, uh, we're told by Luke that she had been bent over for 18 years by a spirit of infirmity. You know what Jesus calls her? He calls her a daughter of Abraham. That's not a term for someone who's not a believer. That's a term for someone who believes. Matter of fact, when Paul writes to the Galatians, he actually calls them children of Abraham. Now, is he writing to unbelievers or believers? And yet this woman had an evil spirit that was demonizing her for 18 years and had her bent over double. said, should this woman, a daughter of Abraham, not be set free? And he sets her free from that evil spirit. Uh, You've also got another example in 1 Corinthians 5 uh, of a man who was committing an act of sexual immorality that was so perverse that uh, Paul even says, you don't even find this amongst the pagans. And he was was with his, um, his... uh, dead uh, father's wife. And Paul says, hey, we need to execute. You, you, sh- you guys should have excommunicated this man. But since you have not, I have handed this one over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, but that his soul might be saved. And then we see some inkling or some picture of this that in 2 Corinthians, uh, the guy had likely repented, and Paul is saying, hey, welcome him back into the fellowship. But, but get this. He says, this is a believer in the church in Corinth, and he says, I've handed this one over to Satan. That's a term for excommunication in the church, to be handed over to Satan. How many of you would agree that if somebody's handed over to Satan, they're demonized? Like on some level, they're in the domain of darkness once again. Um, Trying to think of some other examples just offhand of of this. Uh, Hymenaeus and Alexander, I've handed them over to Satan so they'd be taught not to blasphemy. These are believers that Paul is having to discipline. So, can a Christian be demonized? I would say so. Uh, so, how do these things get a foothold in our lives? Well, we've talked about one already, right? Um, anger and unforgiveness. We saw this in uh, Ephesians, and I'm going to give you sort of a list of, of different ways that people get demonized. And, and this is by no means a comprehensive list. It's just a sort of, uh, here's some easily provable ones from the Scriptures. So, anger and unforgiveness. So from Ephesians uh, chapter 4, verse 26 through 27, Paul says, Be angry, yet do not sin. Now get, catch this. He says, Be angry, yet do not sin. So is anger in and of itself a sin? No. Anger is a natural, normal human emotion. It's not having anger that, that creates sin. It's not dealing with our anger appropriately. Allowing our anger to remain because of unforgiveness. That's the sin. It's what we do out of that anger, the actions, the way we retaliate against others, the way we punish others for the hurt we feel. That's sin. He says, be angry, yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not give the devil a foothold. That word foothold is the same word that I used earlier. It's it's what uh, what we talk about on D-Day. American troops storm the beaches of Normandy. What are they trying to do? Gain a foothold in Western Europe a place from which they can conduct further warfare and push back the powers of Nazi Germany. 
So think about it this way. When you don't deal with your anger and you refuse to forgive your brother from your heart, you're giving the enemy a place in your life, a foothold, a place from which he, he can conduct further warfare. You ever met somebody stuck in unforgiveness? Ever been in unforgiveness yourself? Think about the way that you begin to think about the person you haven't forgiven. You start attributing all kinds of evil to that person, whether it's true or not, because you already have unforgiveness in your heart. It's the enemy twisting the way we think about that other person to such a degree that we begin to hate them and want them to suffer. That's what anger and unforgiveness can do. Uh, we see this, you, we've already mentioned the Matthew chapter 18 and the um, uh, Ephesians 4, but I want to I give, give you a picture of the progression of undealt with anger. Because I don't think it stops there with anger. I think the next step is hatred uh, and bitterness. And then I'd say even further, it leads to a spirit of murder. Nobody who's a murderer starts out that way. We actually see this play out pretty prolifically in the uh, life of Saul, King Saul. If you've got your Bibles, go to 1 Samuel chapter 18. I'm going to give you some scriptural citations for all of this, but I want to go here first because this is where you see it all just sort of go one, one thing to the next. I'm going to have to put in another one in here that I don't have in my notes. But. So 1 Samuel chapter 18. Uh, now we see that, that David has been, has been fighting for, for the armies of Israel, and he's been incredibly successful. And so the reports are coming back to Saul, and here's what Saul is saying, or here's what Saul is hearing. This is uh, chapter 18, verses 8 through 11. It says, then Saul became very angry. Why is he angry? What does he do with his anger? For this saying displeased him, and he said, they have ascribed to David 10,000, but to me they have ascribed thousands. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? Now think about this right there. Uh, I would say another thing we need to put in here is the word jealousy. When you want what someone else has, and you get angry because of it. So he starts out with anger because he's jealous. And then it says, what more can David have but the kingdom? And he looked at David with suspicion from that day forward. So the next thing you have is like a, a fear. And I would say suspicion, paranoia. So he looked at David with suspicion from that day on. Now it came about on the next day that an evil spirit from God came mightily upon Saul. An evil spirit. See how he's getting more and more demonized? He's not dealing with his anger. And so check out what happens next. He raved in the midst of his house. You ever met somebody raging out? Um, while David was playing the harp with his hand, as usual, and a spear was in Saul's hand, Saul hurled the spear, for he thought, I will pin David to the wall. But David escaped from his presence twice. What did Saul try to do to David? Nobody starts out a murderer. It starts with not dealing with your anger. Right? Um. There's another passage, I think, that, that kind of brings some of this into the limelight here, hatred, bitterness, and jealousy. And it's out of James chapter 3. You see this sort of uh, word picture or uh, comparison being made, a juxtaposition, where uh, James is going to talk about the wisdom that comes from God and the wisdom that comes from the enemy. Here's what he says in, in chapter 3, verse 13. He says, "'Who among you is wise in understanding?' Well, let him show his good behavior by his deeds and the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and lie against the truth. Now, I catch this out. He's not just, is ambition in and of itself wrong? No, it's good to be ambitious, right? 
but we want to be ambitious for the right things. We want to be ambitious for the kingdom of heaven, for God's kingdom to reign and rule over all of the earth, transforming the people of this earth into a people that give glory to God. We want his light to transform the entire world. Good to have ambition. The problem is, is when that ambition is for ourselves. Selfish ambition, right? It's about me getting a platform or me getting to do X, Y, and Z or me getting all the money, me getting to have control. It says, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, and demonic. Now, here's the crazy part, and I, I always... I used to miss this every time I'd read this passage. He says, this wisdom, meaning bitter jealousy, selfish ambition, is a type of wisdom. How many of you know people with uh, selfish ambition that are actually able to accomplish quite a lot? Yeah, well, selfish ambition can get you all kinds of things, but it is earthly, natural, and demonic. So when you're operating out of selfish ambition and bitter jealousy, what, uh, what or whom is having an impact on your life? It's demonic wisdom that we're employing. Do we really want to participate in something demonic? For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. But the wisdom from above is pure, peaceful, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Um, ever been jealous of anybody? I've always found it that it's usually the people that I like the most that I'm the most jealous of. Now, what do you do when you're jealous of one of your close friends? The same thing you do with any other sin in our lives. Confess it. I've found when I go to, go to my friends that I'm jealous of and I just tell them, Brother, I don't know what to say about this. I'm embarrassed even to acknowledge it, but I have been wildly jealous of you. You'd be surprised at the freedom that you suddenly experience when you just bring it into the light. Um, that's what it means in, in 1 John when he says, walk in the light as he is in the light. It doesn't, walking in the light doesn't mean walking free from sin. How many of you thought that? You thought walking in the light means you're just walking sinlessly. Good luck on this side of heaven. <laughs> Walking in the light doesn't mean walking free from sin. It means walking with your sin exposed, where everything is made known. You're not saying you're free from it. You're just saying, hey, I'm struggling with this, and I just want to make sure that it's known. I'm not keeping anything in darkness. That's why he says, confess your sins to one another, that you might be healed. There's a sense in which when we confess these things, that suddenly the weight and the control that it has over us is gone. Um, and, and there's a, a, a sort of a rule of thumb. If you can't talk about it, it owns you. But when we bring things in the light, the blood of Jesus, it, it cleanses us from unrighteousness. Um, I mentioned fear and suspicion and paranoia. I think that plays a bigger part in our lives than we realize. How many times in the scriptures do you see the words, do not fear? How many of you know that things that you do out of fear usually don't go so well for you? Now, I know this firsthand because, like I said, I struggled with the fear of rejection and abandonment. What did that cause me to do in relationships? Smother the person so they couldn't stand being in my presence. They felt so suffocated they had to get out. Right? So acting out of fear is sin. Um, I think it's one of those kinds of sins that we tend to ignore and fail to recognize it for what it is. Um, hatred and violence, we see this with uh, or, uh, murder. We see this in Luke chapter 9 with the Pharisees. It says when his, Oh, well, actually, we see it with the apostles too, but in John 8, 44, let me give you this one first. He says this to the Pharisees. You are of your father the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning. He does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So what do the Pharisees want to do? Well, they want to kill the Lord. And he says, you are of your father, the devil, for you want to do the desires of your father. When you're participating in the desires of the devil, it shows you who your father is. Um, and then in Luke chapter 9, and this is the one that we often ignore, we tend to look at the apostles as though they were the holy men of God who never had done anything wrong. But here's what happens when, uh, 
when they encounter a group of people known as the Samaritans. This is Luke chapter 9, verses 54 through 56. When his disciples, James and John, what's another title for James and John in the scriptures? Sons of Thunder. Here's probably why. It says, when they saw this, the Samaritan people, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? Jesus turned and rebuked them. It's like he goes, what? You do not know what kind of spirit you were of. Well, what kind of spirit were they of? Well, how about racism, murder, hatred? You see, Jews hated the Samaritans. Many Jews, when they would come up to Samaria, instead of going right through the city to get to the other side, they would literally walk miles, an extra day's journey just to go around it. Because they saw the Samaritans as a lesser class of people, right? There was a lot of controversy over the Samaritans. And one of the reasons they were looked down upon is because of, uh, they disobeyed the law. And the law says that Jews were to marry Jews only, but the Samaritans, these were Jewish people that had intermingled and had married and, and taken wives from other people groups. And so they were a mixed race when, when Israel is supposed to be a, a, a nation separated for God's purposes only. They weren't to intermarry, and yet that's exactly what the Samaritans did. They also denied most of the Old Testament. They would only adhere to the first five books of the law. Not only that, there's a big controversy about where the center of Yahweh worship was supposed to take place. The Jews would say Jerusalem. The Samaritans would say Samaria. And so there was this constant religious, racist uh, uh, comparison going on. Uh, Jews hated Samaritans. And so when Jesus says, you don't know what kind of spirit you're of, well, they're just displaying a spirit, sure enough, just not one that's the Holy Spirit. Um, a spirit of murder and jealousy. This is the apostles. This is Jesus' A-team. And this is the kind of spirit they're displaying after they've been walking with the Lord for some time. Um, another reason people can be demonized, and this one's often not talked about, or if it is talked about, it's talked about in a way as though it's fictitious is occult practices. Now, I would say today, this is probably becoming more commonplace than you realize. Uh, let me just give you a couple verses, and I'll tell you some stories. In Leviticus chapter 19, verse 31, and again, Leviticus chapter 20, verse 6, um, Moses will say this. He says, do not turn to mediums, or spiritist, do not seek them out to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. And as for the person who turns to mediums and to spiritists to play the harlot after them, I will set my face against that person and will cut him off from among his people. That sounds like some serious consequences, don't you think? If you're cut off from the people of God, where are you? In the domain of the enemy. Deuteronomy 18, verses 9 through 13, he says, When you enter the land which the Lord your God gives you, you shall not learn to imitate the detestable things of those nations. There should be none among you who makes his son or daughter pass through fire, or one who uses divination, or one who practices witchcraft, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who casts a spell, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead, or necromancy. He says, for whoever does these things is detestable to the Lord. And because of these things, the Lord your God will drive them out from before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God. Notice in here, when he goes through these lists of occult practices, he never once says that it's fictitious. He doesn't say, oh, don't, don't imitate the fictitious practices of those Canaanites. He says, don't do the things that they do, and don't consort with those who do them. Why? These things are detestable to God. They're a counterfeit source of knowledge. We know what it's like when we eat knowledge that we shouldn't eat. Now, uh, I, was in, um, I was in Denmark doing a conference, and there was a lady who I was talking to, and she was sort of asking some questions, and as I was uh, trying to speak some truth to her, she screams out and says, I can see. And I look at her and I go, could you not see before? 
She says, no, I, I wear contacts. I left them at home, but I can suddenly see. I thought, wow, praise God, what a miracle, right? You know, the blind get their sight. The next day, I'm at another church preaching, and she's there, and she comes up to me, and she says, uh, my vision problems have come back. And I go, oh, okay. Now, oftentimes, when I've seen a disease or an infirmity leave, but then it comes back, usually I'm dealing with something demonic. In other words, there was power to get them free, but they didn't repent from the sin that they were committing, and so that thing has come back. And so I'm talking to the, the woman, and now I had heard from a pastor that she had participated in some sort of clairvoyancy practices. So I asked her, I said, um, tell me about some of your spiritual experiences. And so she goes on to tell me how ever since she was a kid, she could see dead people. I was thinking of the sixth sense, and he's like, I see dead people. You ever notice how that kid whispers louder than a normal man talks? Uh, it's a great movie, by the way. Uh, I, I won't give up the ending. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, she says, I, I've seen dead people. And so she goes on to tell me how she's been helping people contact their dead relatives so they can get some sort of reconciliation. I said, oh, okay. Well, I think I know why the eyesight problems have come back. And I said, and also, and this is when the Lord starts to speak to me, I said, you also get uh, uh, migraines in the back of your head and in your neck. You get a lot of pain. And she goes, yes, that's right. She goes, well, well what do I need to do? I said, well, why does it come back? I said, well, what you're doing is actually forbidden by God, and because of it, an evil spirit has afflicted you. She goes, what? I go, yeah, 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 you're doing God the test. He says that this is an evil practice. She goes, where does God say this? I go, oh, right here, and I open up Deuteronomy 18, and I show it to her, and I open up uh, Leviticus 19, Leviticus 20, and I said, right, right here, you see this? He says, uh, consort with somebody who practices, who calls up the dead. It's called necromancy. Um, and you've been taking classes on clairvoyancy too, right? And she goes, yeah. And she goes, well, why would God forbid this? It's helping so many people. I said, I, I don't know why he forbids it. I just know that it's killing you. And because of it, an evil spirit has come in to afflict you. You're, you're calling forth the dead, and you're getting some demons in, in, in the process. And she goes, well, how do I know it's a demon? And I said, well, would you like to know? She goes, yes. I said, okay. In the name of Jesus, I command you to come forth. And when I said that, it was like she started screaming. Now, this is an old Lutheran, like, nice, dressed-up, button-up collared shirt, right? And she starts screaming. And I said, stop it in Jesus' name. And, and she goes quiet, and she just starts to, to weep. And she said she could feel something clawing at her stomach and screaming in her head. Now, I know that I'm telling a pretty serious story here, and a lot of you are, like, wide-eyed. Let me just remind you again, who is the one with all the power? The Lord Jesus, right? The, the devil, another word for his, him is uh, Beelzebul. It means Lord of the flies. How big are his minions? Okay, we got to keep things in perspective. We're the ones with the power. It's those of us in Christ. We're supposed to trample on serpents and scorpions alike. We're the ones with the power. Now, when I tell you a story of some evil thing manifesting, we got to keep it in perspective, right? We don't want to overinflate the power of the enemy. It is the Lord Jesus Christ who has bound the strong man. So uh, I said, well, uh, and she starts crying. She tells me about how she could feel this thing clawing at her stomach and screaming in her head. I said, well, if you'd like, I can make that go. Um, but you have to stop what you're doing. She says, do I have to? I go, yes, you do. They always ask that question, do I have to? I said, yes, you do. If I, don't, if I command that thing to leave there's a good chance that it'll actually go and find other evil spirits more evil, more sadistic than itself, and you'll be in a worse place. It might even try to take your life. I said, so if you want to be free, you absolutely have to repent from that practice. And she says, will you be back tomorrow? I go, yeah, I'll be back tomorrow. She goes, do you think you'll come back next year? I go, yeah, I'll probably be back next year. She goes, I think I need to hold off for now. Isn't that crazy? So I had to leave that woman with her demons. And uh, you know the reason why? is because that's how she was making her living. She was helping people contact their dead relatives. 
Now, I pled with her. I said, listen to me. You do not want to continue this practice. It's going to try to take your life. And yet she wanted to, to continue on practicing necromancy and clairvoyancy and consorting with mediums and spiritists. Um, let me give you some more stories because I, I think this stuff helps illustrate it. With the anger and forgiveness, I first saw this when uh, I was praying for a bunch of people. A lady came to me. She said she had a, she, her whole body was riddled with uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and she had burns from spilling water, from boiling water all over herself, like burn marks. Um, and she was so riddled with arthritis, she had to have a walker, and she couldn't lift up her arms. And so I'm sitting down to pray with her, and I, uh, as I pray with her, I see a picture of she and her sister, and they had parted ways. And so I said, hey, listen, I'd, I'd love for, to, to pray for you to be healed, but I feel like the Lord is showing me that you have some unforgiveness towards your sister. Is that true? And she looks down, and she goes, yeah, that's true. I said, do you think you'd be willing to forgive your sister from your heart? I believe that if you're willing to do that, God will heal you of the rheumatoid arthritis. And she goes, yes, I, I'd be willing to do that. And so I walked her through a prayer of repentance, just saying, Lord, would you forgive me for holding a grudge against my sister? Uh, I forgive my sister for what she's done to me. Would you forgive her as well? And would you forgive me for holding this grudge against her? So she prays that, that prayer, and then I pray, and, then, and I say, in the name of Jesus, I command any evil spirit that's come through unforgiveness to leave now and never bother her again. And I said, Lord, would you come in great mercy and healing power and restore every part of her body? I said, well, why don't you check it out and see how you're doing? And she goes, well, I can't really walk without a walker. I said, well, let's just give it a shot. We just prayed. So she stands up and she, she grabs her walker. And she puts it down in front of her and she goes like this. I couldn't do that before. I go, you, you couldn't walk backwards? She goes, no, every time I'd walk backwards, I'd fall down. Uh, and then she, I go, well, it sounds like God might have healed you. And she takes another step. And then she goes, oh, God, and just starts worshiping. She put her arms up in the air. Remember, she couldn't lift up her arms. Now in front of all of us, she's got her arms up the air, and she's just worshiping God and crying. Um, I've seen that happen a number of times uh, where unforgiveness and bitterness has caused people to be uh, afflicted. Um, fear and paranoia. Uh, well, one, I've told you my own story a little bit. I haven't told you about all the things I had to do to get free. But um, I remember one time I was at a church where uh, there was a young girl who was brought to me. She uh, was saying that she had pain in her chest. Well, when she walks up to me, and this is the, really the way I, anytime I pray for somebody, I'm always doing two things. I'm listening to them, and I'm listening to God. Because sometimes people don't really know why they're afflicted, but God does. So I'm always asking the Lord, what is the reason this person is sick? Maybe it's just a natural part of living in this world. Maybe it's something demonic. Not every sickness is a demon. Not every demon comes with a sickness. And so we're always listening to the Lord to find out what it is that we're dealing with. And so uh, anyway, this girl comes to me, and right then as she walks up to me, I know more than just that she's got pain in her chest. I know that she has panic attacks and that she has night terrors. And so I said to her, I said, do you, uh, oh, and I also know that when she was uh, at a certain age, she had been uh, molested. And I said, um, I said, do you, uh, and I knew the reason why was that she was watching horror films that she had an unhealthy obsession with horror films. I'm not, I'm not saying that she just watched a horror film. I'm saying she had an obsession. She had to watch every single one. And because of it, there was an evil spirit that was sort of taking advantage of her and playing on these fears. And so I said, uh, I feel like the Lord is showing me that you don't just have pain in your chest, but you also have night terrors and panic attacks. Is that true? She goes, yes. I said, well, I can pray for you, but I felt like the Lord is telling me that you have to stop watching horror films. You know what she asked me? Do I have to? Every time. I said, yes, you do. And I gave her the same reasons. If, if I ca cast this thing out and you keep doing what you're doing, then you're going to be in a worse state. So I walked her through a prayer of repentance. I commanded that thing to leave, and it left. And then I said, now, it, this was a guy-girl situation. So when it came to the abuse that she had suffered, I didn't think it was appropriate that I deal with that with her. 
especially as a young man at the time. I was in my mid-20s. And so I said, um, that youth leader over there that brought you up here, I want you to go and talk to her and tell her about what, you, what happened to you when you were about 11 years old. I said, do you know what I'm talking about? And she looks at me and she goes, yes. And I said, listen, I know that that was not a good thing. And I know that you probably blame yourself, but this is not your fault. Um, and I think if you go and talk to your youth leader about it, uh, God's going to set you free from a lot of the bad feelings you have associated with that behavior. And so she goes over to the youth leader, starts confessing everything about what had happened to her, and, and starts getting free of all the shame and, and condemnation that she'd been carrying for years. Um, something else to know is it's not always the sins that we commit that can get us afflicted. Sometimes it's sins committed against us. But we blame ourselves when that happened. And I know this because uh, I mentioned I was demonized from a young age. Well, that was because of the rejection. But I was also demonized later in life because I had been molested as a young man. Now, this is one area that most people don't talk about, especially men. There's so much shame attached to those kind of things that most people don't want anybody to know. And that's the way I lived most of my life. I thought if anybody knows about what happened to me when I was a young man, they will think I'm damaged. And the Lord set me free from that evil spirit when I was around 21 years old. And again, the rule of thumb is if you can't talk about it, it owns you. And so today, I am shameless when it comes to talking about these things. The statistics are one in four women and one in five men. But you would never know it, would you? And that's just what's reported so it's not just the sins we've committed, it's the sins committed against us, and it doesn't do us any good to keep it in the darkness. We have to talk about these things. It takes a great deal of courage, but I'll also tell you this, God will meet you in that place, and he will set you free. Um, I know I'm getting into a lot of stuff. Uh, something else about the occult practices is um, this is happening to more and more of our youth today. I've seen this happen on, I mean, on more occasions I count, honestly, but two specific stories that, that come to mind is I remember a, a woman at the Convergence Conference in 2017. Um, this lady comes up to me, and she complains of having night terrors that she's had uh, ever since she was a kid. And I said, well, do you remember exactly when this took place? She goes, no, I don't remember. I said, well, let me just pray and ask the Lord. And I prayed, and I saw a picture of her playing with a Ouija board with a couple of her girlfriends. And I said, um, when you were about 12 years old, did you and some girlfriends play with a Ouija board? And she looks at me, eyes wide open, and goes, I didn't know. I, I didn't know. I didn't know. And just starts crying. And I said, of course you didn't know. It's in the game section at Target. Like literally, this is what the enemy's plans are. He plans to afflict our kids. And he'll put demonic inst instruments for, for uh, what are you, divination in the game section at Target. And you'll see a little kid playing with it on the board. I mean, on the box. Isn't that crazy? So I walked her through a prayer of repentance. Here's what that prayer looked like. Lord, would you forgive me for having participated in divination and, and Ouija boards? Um, if there's anything evil that's come against me because of this, would you deliver me? And then I prayed and I commanded that thing to leave her body. And when I did, she got healed from that day forward. I ran into her two years later. Now, now listen to this. Her night terrors were so bad. She was married, had three little girls. She would wake up every night, every night, screaming at the top of her lungs, waking up her entire family. And this had been going on for years. Two years later, I'm at Conver Convergence Conference in 2019. She, I run into her, and she's been free ever since. You can actually listen to her testimony online. It's pretty amazing. Uh, another woman, I was in uh, Delaware doing a conference, teaching on this very thing. And this woman, as I was speaking, which some of you may be experiencing this right now, uh, she was listening to me teach, and she found herself just wanting to hate me. She was just filled with rage. And so she literally got up and walked out of the meeting, intending to leave, and she, she decided, to, like, I'll go to the bathroom. She goes to the bathroom, and she's like, I'm going to leave after I go to the bathroom. And she hears the Lord say, this is why you're here. Go back in there. And so she just sort of walks back in, and meanwhile, she's just feeling this rage against me for teaching this stuff. And she, uh, so afterwards, she says, can I talk to you? And I said, sure. And she tells me, I've been feeling this anger and hatred towards you ever since you started speaking. And, and I'm going, why, well, you too, lady. No, no, I just didn't say that. Uh, 
I didn't say that. I, I immediately was like, ah, okay, I know what we're dealing with. <laughs> uh, I said, well, uh, I, I said, what do you, when did this start? She goes, oh, I don't know. I, I, I was, she's like, I just, when I started listening to you, and I said, and I was, again, I'm listening to the Lord, and I saw a picture of her doing a, a tarot card reading um, with another woman. And I said, did you have your tarot card reading with a, another woman? She goes, yeah, actually, when I was a kid, my neighbor, her mom, would practice tarot readings and tea leaf readings. I said, did you let her do that with you? She goes, yeah. I said, well, I think there's a spirit of hatred that's come in through an occult practice. And if you'd like, I, I can pray for you, but you need to repent from having done that and promise to never do it again. And she says, okay. And so I lead her through a prayer. And then I command the thing to leave. And then she starts dry heaving and shaking. And, and the thing finally leaves. And again, sometimes these things leave violently. and It's not always pretty. Okay, but we want to do the best. And this is the reason why I'm not going to do this from the stage is I actually don't believe it's a good thing to do this in front of large audiences. It doesn't protect that person's dignity. And there's nothing to be gained by having a spectacle. It doesn't do anybody any favors. Um, and, and, and at the end of the day, the Lord cares about that person that's demonized, and we want to protect them uh, from other observers and what others might think of that. So anyway, um, pray for her. She gets delivered comes back the next day and tells me she wasn't just delivered from that evil spirit. She would have this problem where she would sleep, uh, not just sleep walk, but sleep eat. Ever heard of this? Really? I had never heard of this. I thought this was the weirdest thing I'd ever heard. Um, but I'm telling you, she'd get up in the middle of the night, she would try to go on diets, and, uh, and she would do really well during the day, but then she'd wake up the next morning and the fridge would be left open, and there'd be wrappers and, and cartons of all the leftover food that she had just been eating during the night, having no recollection of sleep eating. From that day forward, she never sleepwalked or sleep eat, sleep ate. I don't even know how you say it. Uh, <laughs> never did that again. <laughs> the Lord set her free. But again, how did it come? Through what seemed innocent to her, like a game that she did with her neighbor's mom. But I'm telling you, don't do this. Is there anybody in the room where you feel like you, you participated and you think, you know, I might got something I need to pray through? Is that true? Okay. Listen, I, I highly encourage you, if you've ever participated in any of those things, you need to receive prayer. Are you going to have a prayer team? Well, I can, I can lead them through a prayer uh, publicly, but I, I think it would be good to have yeah, some private me, prayer. Because somebody had asked, let me find it. Um... Again, Doing these things is also not a guarantee that you have a demon. Demons aren't omnipresent, right? Yeah. It's just opening the door. It's like an invitation to be afflicted. Some, and it's not a guarantee that you'll have one. Somebody sent in a question and said, I believe that there might be a little demon on my back. How do I rid myself of it? And just as you were talking, to reiterate, prayer team tonight, uh, you can find, if, find me. If I'm busy, you can find somebody else on the prayer team. Um, but we would love to pray for you. So let me, I'm going to keep going. I've still got a few more notes, and I know we need time for questions. So uh, I, I wish I had more time on this topic because I'm like, I'm just scratching the surface here. Um, another way that people get demonized is through idolatry. That seems like a no-brainer, right? Uh, so we see this in 1 Corinthians 10, chapter, or chapter 10, verse 20. It says, no, but I say to you, the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to become sharers in demons. So most people, when they get converted out of another religion, oftentimes they need deliverance. Matter of fact, deliverance ministry was standard practice of the early church. Before you could be uh, baptized into the Christian faith, you would have a deliverance. And it's been a practice uh, that's been long lost, honestly. But it was normative that people got delivered of demons when they came into the faith, especially because they were coming from idolatrous backgrounds. They were worshiping the pantheon of gods uh, in the Roman society. And so they, they needed deliverance. Uh, Revelation 9.20 says, The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent from the work of their hands so as not to worship demons and the idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. 1 Timothy 6.9 he says, but those who want to get rich, now this is an interesting one, those who want to get rich fall into a temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. Those who want to get rich. 
What's another word for that in our culture? Greed. Participating in greed. Is having wealth bad? No. No, it's the blessing of the Lord that brings wealth, and he adds no trouble to it. Accumulating wealth through greed, however, adds a lot of trouble, right? The blessing of the Lord, he adds no trouble. Accumulating wealth through greed, trouble. Uh, and then Colossians 3, 5, Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. Greed amounts to idolatry. Here's another way of thinking of idolatry. Anything that you believe where you can fill in the a blank with this statement, or fill in, yeah, fill in the, the blank on this statement, I will not be happy unless I have, this was me. I worshipped the girls that I dated. I thought I will be not happy unless I can get the one walking away. That's called idolatry. The reason why that girl could not handle uh, me smothering her was because she had become my God. None of us are meant to be gods to one another. We cannot handle it. Right? I will not be happy unless I have or unless I do and fill in the blank with whatever. That is an idol in your life, and you must repent from it. It's simple prayer of this. Lord, forgive me for worshiping, fill in the blank. I renounce blank. I will never worship it again, and I will worship you alone. And then if you have somebody praying with you, they need to command that evil thing to leave. Now, I was praying with a woman who said she had shadows that followed her, and this was in Denmark. Now, in Denmark and most of Scandinavia, there's been a resurgence of, of worship of the old Norse gods. And so when she tells me she has shadows that follow her and she wants me to pray for her, uh, I prayed for her. I said, Lord, why does she have shadows that are following her? And I see a picture of a fireplace with these four gods on her mantle. And I said, um, I feel like the Lord is showing me that you have four gods that you're worshiping, and you've been committing idolatry, and that's why you have these shadows follow uh, you. Uh, it's commanded in Scripture that we're to worship the Lord our God alone and fear him alone. I said, but you've been worshiping these other idols alongside Jesus. I go, is that true? She says, yes. I said, well, would you like to be free from it? She goes, yeah. I said, well, then you need to... Stop worshiping those idols. You need to destroy them or put them in the trash. And so um, she says, <laughs> and I said, yes, you do. And she said, well, they're going to be very angry with me. Seriously. I said, I understand that. I said, but you, you need to renounce these gods. And so I walk her through that prayer of repentance. I can, I, I, she renounces her allegiance to those gods and declares her allegiance to Jesus alone. And then I prayed, and I commanded them to leave. And when I did, it was like somebody punched her in the gut. Oh, this is the other thing. I had her renounce them name by name, all four, one by one. I renounced my allegiance to this, this, and this. Um, and then, yeah, it, when those things left, it was like somebody punched her in the gut. She just bowls over and starts crying. I said, are you okay? She goes, yes, I'm just very scared. And uh, I said, well, let's pray, and I want you to ask Jesus uh, what's going to happen from here on out. And when she prays, she fell into a trance. Suddenly, she's just gone. She can't hear me. She's not responding to me. She's just gone. And a few minutes goes by, and she comes out of the trance, and she tells me that she saw this mountain, a huge mountain, and that the Lord was standing in front of the mountain, but he was bigger than the mountain. And suddenly she was filled with peace, and she just knew that he was going to protect her from that day forward. Um, the next day I run into her, and she's, she's you know, cleaned out and free, no more shadows. And she had boxed, put a, all those little uh, idols in a box, and she said, are you sure that I have to destroy them? Um, like, could I just give them to my neighbor? And I go, no, no, you can't give them to your neighbor. I mean, she was serious. I think because these things cost money, she's just thinking, well, this is a lot of money. And I'm going, no, it's, it's a demon. So there's so many other stories I literally don't have time to get into. Um, another thing that I didn't mention was uh, lust, sexual immorality, and perversion. That seems like a no-brainer to us today. Well, maybe not. 
And I'm, I'm differentiating between these things. Because those are different kinds of um, uh, sins. Uh, we see this in the Proverbs. Let me give you a quick. Uh, Proverbs 5, 7 through 9. Now, this is Solomon writing to his sons, right? How many of you would agree that what you have to say to your kids is really important? So here's what he says. He says, now then, my sons, listen to me and do not depart from the words of my mouth. Keep your way far from her. Who's her? He's talking about the prostitute. He says, do not go near the door of her house or you will give your vigor or strength to others and your years to the cruel one. Who's the cruel one? I don't know exactly what that means, but it doesn't sound good. Um, And this absolutely is a sin. Even though our culture today, since the 1960s, the sexual revolution has been telling us it's not bad, but the Lord says otherwise. Now, he is your creator, and he knows exactly what you were created for. And when you give yourself over to passions that are impure, it is an open door for the enemy to afflict us. Um, I highly recommend you stay away from that. We also read about already, 1 Corinthians 5.5, 5, the man who is sleeping with his dead, mother's, or dead father's wife. He's handed over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. Again, participating in these practices, any of them, is not a guarantee that you will be demonized, but it is an invitation. And we don't want to give those invitations to evil spirits because here's, here's their end game. Their end game is to cause your depression. Their end game is to cause your fear and anxiety. Their end game is to destroy your life and keep you away from the life-giving nature of a relationship with Christ. There's a reason why when we're in sin, we do not want to follow God. We like our sin, and our sin separates us from him. God is our creator. He is not trying to take away our joy and our happiness. If anything, he actually wants to give us abundant life. Uh, And we think that those things will give us life, but we're being lied to. Those things are not life-giving. They're life-stealing. That's the end goal. Um, Let me do this. Just a a couple of things. If you're going to pray for people, you always want to do it with two or three, never by yourself. Highly The demonized, you don't want to do this by yourself. You should always also have somebody recording the time. Just because there's always accusations of things, especially from those who are demonized, uh, that could come about. And so when you record the time, there's open disclosure, there's full accountability. Uh, I would say men don't pray with women. Uh, Women don't pray with men. If if you're a man and you have somebody who needs deliverance, get a woman to pray with you. Um, you For me, I usually get my wife to pray with me. Uh, We should not stay up all night with somebody to get them free. Matter of fact, I, I set appointments. I'll pray for you for an hour at this time. Uh, And we should never hold anybody down who's demonized. You know, the the lady I mentioned earlier that was, was, something was screaming in her head and clawing at her stomach, what did I say to the demon? That's all that needs to happen. You're the one with the authority. They have to do what you say because you're in Christ. Remember, Jesus said, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. In Ephesians, we're told that He's seated on a throne above every rule, every authority, every principality. So all authority is him, is his, his, and we are seated with Christ. Okay, that's not talking about some weird metaphysical reality. It's talking about the authority that we have in Christ over these things. And so when somebody is manifesting a demon, they're acting out, supernatural strength, all those kind of things, simply tell it what to do, right? We should never have to hold somebody down. You shouldn't go long periods of time. Uh, Fasting and prayer, really good idea before you start casting out a demon. Um, These are just some of the best practices that I would recommend. So yeah, set boundaries for yourself. Um, And then, you know, repent from any sins you have. Bring it into the light. Confess it to your brothers and sisters. Uh, Yeah. All right, let me take some time for questions. All right, I got... A few here. Um, so let's go. The first one uh, is along the lines with Christians and having a demon. Um, oh, let me, I, sorry, I, I need to say one more thing. Yeah, go for it. Because I told you guys that I was afflicted because of the rejection and abandonment. 
Uh, in Corinthians, it talks about, 2 Corinthians, about how we take every thought captive. Right? We're, we're, our warfare is not fleshly or carnal, but it's for the tearing down of strongholds. It's spiritually empowered. Um, my problem was I didn't know the difference between my thoughts and that spirit of rejection because it was so intertwined with my personality. So when my girlfriend didn't text me back, I would start thinking, oh, she doesn't want to be with me anymore, even though it had only been five minutes. <laughs> and I would start to, but here's the thing is it felt true. And that's the nature of the lies we believe. They feel true. And that's actually the way your brain works, right? The way that neurology it takes place, it's like building a muscle. When you've been thinking something for so long in your life, it produces not just a little bit of emotion, but a tsunami of emotion. And it pummels you. And out of that, to try to escape that emotion, we act in all kinds of sinful ways. And so the only way to get rid of it is to take that thought captive. Hardest thing about thoughts that we believe that are lies is we're not always aware that we're thinking of them. They're subconscious. How can you take a thought captive you're not aware you're thinking? How can you take anything captive you're not aware exists? So what we have to do is, is become aware of those thoughts that we've been believing, those habitual ways of thinking. Now, let me just prove to you that your thoughts produce emotions. Close your eyes for one second. I, I want you to think about your favorite dessert. For me, it's cheesecake. Now, think, think of yourself with a fork in hand and that dessert right in front of you, and you're just slicing off one little piece of it and putting it to your mouth. Imagine the way it tastes. Open your eyes real quick. How many of you are salivating? How many of you are finding yourselves hungry? So your thoughts produce a physiological response, right? They actually affect the way you feel. It produces hunger. Same thing is true with the lies we believe. When you think about someone not loving you, like this is what happens to me. Oh, she doesn't want to be with me anymore, right? Because subconsciously I believed I'm not worth loving, not worth sticking around for, I'm not worth knowing. Is that true? No, but it feels true. The truth is, is that Jesus loves me. I do not need the love of a woman because God provides me with all the love that I need, all the love that I need, and he'll never leave me and never forsake me. We know something's worth because of what someone will pay for it. What did God pay for you and I? The blood of his infinite son, showing us exactly what our worth is. You are worth the blood of, your, of the son of God. An infinite being, we have infinite worth to God. So the truth was, is that I was worth knowing and loving. By the way, uh, today I'm married happily. I don't worry about my wife leaving me. If by chance she ever did, I know that life is still going to be good and okay. Because God loves me, and his love is all the love that I need in this world. So that's a lot of it. And I did get free of that evil spirit, I, um, and there's more to that story, but I don't have time to get into it. Okay, sorry, your question. And ask it quickly. Cause how, can a holy, how can the Holy Spirit dwell with a demon in a believer post-Pentecost? Uh, I mean, well, the Holy Spirit dwells with us all the time, and we have all kinds of sin. <laughs> yeah. We act demonically. How many of you would agree that you have sin in your life? Well, how can the Holy Spirit dwell with sin? You know, we, we, we act out in sin, but yet God still allows the Holy Spirit in us. And, and James even touches on this in James 5, right? He says, do you not know that you're a temple of the holy God? Right? Like, he jealously desires the Spirit which he's made to dwell in us. And he's talking about how they ask, with, uh, ask God for things, and they're not getting their prayers answered because they're asking with impure, impure motivation. And yet the Holy Spirit still lives within us. Uh, there's two that are very similar, so I'll uh, tackle those two. Um, w what's the role of counseling and emotional health? Is deliverance, is a one-time deliverance all that's usually needed, or is it ongoing? The other person asks, um, when people are freed from demons, especially through trauma, how do we encourage them to pursue emotional health and maturity for continued yeah, healing? Just for the record, with my getting free from my own demonic ways of thinking, the stronghold of my mind, and, and I, it was a real demon. I actually saw it uh, in my bedroom. Um, I went to counseling. I did group therapy. Uh, I did all kinds of trauma counseling. I actually think counseling is really good and should be utilized. I also think when you're dealing with a demon, it has to be expulsed, like it has to be expelled. Um, so it's not a one or the other, it's a both and. The reason why counseling is so good, especially cognitive therapy, is it helps us to change the way we think. It helps us to recognize, become conscious of the negative sh thoughts that we have in our lives, the lies that we've believed, and to take them captive. 
And then the, the benefit we have as believers is we can replace it with truth. And so for us as believers, it is important to meditate on the truth. Every morning I would start praising God. And the reason I, I wouldn't just think the truth or say the truth, I would praise God for the truth because that turns it into an experience with God. So I would wake up in the morning saying, God, thank you that you'll never leave me. Thank you that you'll never forsake me. Thank you that you love me just the way I am because, Jesus, you died on a cross for me before I repented. Um, and I would meditate on that so that it would be, go from a place of being just a fact lodged away in my head to something I felt the truth of. If you want to know if you really believe something, it should provoke a feeling in you when you think about it. When you think about God's great love for you, what does it provoke in you? If it's a fact lodged away in your head, it has no transformative power. That's why Jesus says, the truth will set them free. But it's actually a verse right before it, which says, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Cognitive therapy is super helpful with this. It helps us take the thoughts captive and then replace them with truth. Um, so I don't know if that answered both questions or not, but kind of, I'd say yes to both. Okay. Um, oh, and it's not always a one-time deliverance. Uh, sometimes you have several meetings. Like I said, I usually take an hour appointment at a time and schedule another one if there's more needed. Um, have you found that certain ailments are tied to the demonic? Um, uh, sometimes. The, yeah, the person said, for instance, kidney spoons to a spirit of lust. Is there any? Uh, I've heard reproductive stuff tied to mother issues. Um, what's your opinion on that? Maybe. My problem is you do see some scriptural precedent for it, but you also don't want to become reliant upon any kind of formula. Uh, yeah, I've seen people with rheumatoid arthritis get healed, and they had unforgiveness, and that was a common one. I've also seen people get healed of arthroid, or, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and there was nothing demonic about it, no sin involved. I literally saw it a week and a half ago. A lady, I looked at her, I said, you have rheumatoid arthritis in your wrist and carpal tunnel syndrome. And she was like, yes. And we prayed for her, healed on the spot, been free ever since which has only been a week and a half, so it's not a lot of time. But, but I talked to her pastor. He says she's still free. So, um, so if somebody has uh, their own, they're dealing with their own stuff, anxiety, fear, uh, should they, or should they um, pray deliverance for another person who is, comes up to them and says, I'm dealing with anxiety and fear? I mean, I, I have hiatal hernias, and I still pray for people who have hiatal hernias. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the big thing I would say is if you deal with fear and anxiety, um, that's not something you just talk about. You repent. Mm -hmm. And repentance means turning from it. So I'll give you another quick story. Uh, well, it's not a quick story, but I'll try to make it quick. There was a lady. I was in South Africa, and this, this husband kept wanting me to pray for his <laughs> wife. And when that happens, I'm always like, you know, it's probably the husband that's got a problem. Uh, <laughs> you know how that is. Come on. Uh, but I finally sit down with a wife, and I'm like, well, what do you need prayer for? She goes, oh, I don't know. I'm just confused. I said, what are you confused about? And she turns to me, and she goes, I don't like you. And I go, I don't like you either. No. no. I go, sit down. You're not allowed to hurt this woman or anybody in this room. And I had a buddy of mine who was a good old Texas boy. He had never seen anything. He'd heard me tell stories of these things, but never actually seen anything. So I was like, hey, come here. I need your help to pray for something. <laughs> and I said, uh, I start talking to this lady. I said, uh, what do you do to this woman? He goes, oh, you wouldn't know. I said, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I command you, tell me, what, you do, what do you do to this woman? And, and it goes, I cause murder. I cause divorce. And I said, well, you're done doing that. And right then, it terrified me. I, was, I mean, I actually had chills was afraid, and I heard the Lord say, Michael, don't be afraid. It's trying to intimidate you. Remember these things overinflate themselves? Like, oh, yeah, that's what they do, right? And I said, well, you're done doing that. And um, what was the question that led me into this? Uh, anxiety fear, right. Yeah. I, said, uh, to, I said, what gives you access to this woman's life? And he goes, fear. And I said, okay. I said, well, your time's up, and commanded it to leave. Now, my friend actually saw something move up her body and out of her. He actually saw it happen. Freaked him right out. <laughs> and so anyway, we commanded to leave, and she just crumples into my arms, just crying. She has no recollection of the previous 15, 20 minutes, and she'd been completely set free. 
But the reason it got in there, and I turned to the husband, I said, is that that true? Is your wife a fearful woman? He goes, oh, yeah. And so I walked her through a prayer of repentance because she was giving in to every fearful thought that came into her head. Got to remember, thoughts are meant to be taken captive. Evil thoughts, fearful thoughts, okay, they're not always your thoughts. Sometimes they come from an enemy who's trying to afflict you. And so uh, I walked her through a prayer of repentance and got to run into her. Two years later, I went back to South Africa with my wife, and uh, the woman had been free ever since. Oh, I forgot to mention uh, that that she was demonized because her sister-in-law, her husband's uh, sister, uh, had cursed her when they got married. She was a Hindu priestess, and she didn't want uh, her brother to marry a non-Hindu. And the reason why that that curse landed was because of her fear issues. Um, so uh, afterwards, my buddy, his name's Jacob, we, he goes, man, I need to talk to you about what just happened. And I knew we needed to process what he had just seen. He goes, man, you keep telling me stories of these kind of things. And, uh, you know, I, I just, I never really believed you, but uh, I just want to repent. I want to <laughs> repent before you. I want to repent before God. And, and the, the, the funniest thing is, like, I'll hear him tell this story. And, you know, when I said it causes murder, divorce, it's like the fish just keeps getting bigger and bigger. <laughs> He's like, it causes war, it causes famine. <laughs> He's like a good old Texas boy should, right? You know? But the point I mentioned is the anxiety and the fear is something to be repented of, right? Can you rebuke a demon from yourself? You can. I just don't think it's the best way to do things. I think oftentimes, again, we know all the reasons, like Jack said, all the reasons for why we should be afflicted, why God shouldn't set us free. Other people aren't thinking about our sin as much as we are. Uh, other, other people aren't thinking about how unworthy we are um, like we do, right? So it's, it's always far better to have somebody else. But there's also a sense in which we need other people's gifts. And usually they may have a, a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge or a gift of discernment of spirits that might help them to, to know what we need to get free. So I, I, I would say, yes, you can always pray for yourself. I'd highly recommend that you get others to do it. And again, there's no such thing as Lone Ranger Christianity, Jesus Christ did not, did not die on a cross, rise from the dead, and give you the Holy Spirit to make you a one body in Christ so that you can do it alone. The, the baptism of the Spirit is the single unifying factor of all mankind, so why would we ever do solo Christianity? It is not the way we were meant to live. In uh, James 5, it says, confess your sins, not to God, to one another. Now, should you confess your sins to God? Yes, absolutely. But there's a sense in which we bring things into the light to others. It says we have fellowship with one another through that very act. So, and that's what God's intention is. Um, uh, somebody asked, it's like they're living in a household where they feel like someone keeps bringing sin in. I don't know what sin the person's bringing in, but they, maybe they're the only believer in their house. Um, can they be free from demonization if... The, their, their home atmosphere is full of sin. I mean, I would, I would certainly pray about, you know, God, would you put a protection around me and, and allow me to live in this place and then ask for wisdom, right? There's no catch-all answers like these. I mean, this is a, a question that actually needs wisdom for that particular person because of what is taking place in that particular person's house. So, but, but God makes a promise to us. He says, if any of you lack wisdom, we can ask of God. He gives to all generously without fault finding. In other words, God's not going to go through a litany of your sins before he decides whether or not he's going to give you the wisdom that you're asking for. He says, I'm going to do it without fault finding. I'm going to give you wisdom. It's a promise in the scripture to give wisdom to those who are at a crossroads and don't know what to do. Um, And so I I can't give you a catch-all answer for that. I would say just pray and ask the Lord, what am I to do to stay free and let him answer that individually? Now, if it's your house, well, then I would tell them they have to stop. Or they can find a new place to live. Um, we'll do one last one, and then we'll do some uh, prayer. closing thoughts. Yeah, and a prayer. Uh, what do tongues have to do with spiritual warfare? Have you seen uh, effectiveness there? Okay. Uh, a lot of misconceptions about tongues. Some people think that, uh, you know, if you pray in tongues, then the devil don't know what you're saying. Um, I don't find that anywhere in Scripture. There's not a verse that explicitly states that. And as a matter of fact, I've actually had the opposite happen. Remember the story I just told you of the woman who was cursed by a Hindu priestess? Well, I actually, that evil spirit was, um, 
and again, I don't have scriptural precedent for this, I just have my experience, but uh, that evil uh, spirit said, I'm hungry. And, I, and it was just a weird little statement. And that's what they do. They're like childish and try to distract and get our mind off of what's going on. And, uh, and so I started speaking in tongues, and I said, do you understand what I said? And he turned me and goes, yeah, I understood what you said. You said you'll give me something to eat when I leave. And I was like, well, that's hilarious. Like, that, that is truly funny. Um, but, but the point is, I just don't, I don't see it anywhere in Scripture that that's the case. I don't think speaking in tongues determines efficacy in prayer or power. Uh, if anything, I don't find a scripture that says, well, if you pray in tongues, your prayers are more powerful. There's not a single verse. I don't think it's the language that we pray in that determines whether or not our prayers get answered. I think it's the humility in our hearts, right? God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. He hears the prayers of the proud from afar, but he's near to those who are contrite in spirit. So tongues is not about praying more powerfully. Tongues is about praying when we don't know how. It's, I mean, God obviously thinks prayer is super important. So he's like, look, I know that sometimes you're lacking words. Let me help you with that. And he gives you a gift of tongues so that you can pray when you don't know how to pray. It should not be some sort of spiritual merit badge of powerful prayer life. That is not what tongues is. It's just simply a way to overcome our own weakness because we actually need help to pray. We don't know how to pray as we should. And so he gives us a gift to help us with that. So what determines power in prayer? Humility in your heart. Okay, um, I know that some of you had mentioned the occult thing. I'm just going to walk us through a general prayer as a community, and I think we might get some freedom, but I still highly encourage you to get prayer from the prayer team later this evening. So Let me just do this, and uh, you can just do this kind of quietly to yourself. I'm going to walk you through a prayer of repentance. Uh, Maybe by a show of hands, I'm just going to ask, I'm going to point at one of these and see which one you need prayer for, and I'm going to pick the ones that are sort of the highest on the list. Uh, Okay. Uh, A little bit. All right. Okay, well, we've got to talk about this one. Uh, (laughs) Oh, I can't. I'm sorry. Uh, This was anger and unforgiveness. Okay. Uh, Hatred, bitterness, and jealousy. All right. I'm going to skip this one. Uh, This one's uh, fear, suspicion, paranoia. There's a lot more on that one. Okay. Uh, Occult practices. This is usually a lot more common than we realize. It can be dealt with usually pretty easily. Uh, Idolatry. Remember, idolatry is not just idols. It's I cannot be happy unless I have or unless I get to do. I'm going to ask again, idolatry. Uh, lust, sexual immorality, and perversion. Okay. Uh, the one that seems to be the most common in here is the fear, suspicion, and paranoia. Let me see a show of hands on that one again. Okay, I'm going to pray through that and through uh, occult practices. Um, just because I see a lot of freedom with the occult practices in this one in particular. So close your eyes. And I want you to say, uh, Lord, would you forgive me for giving in to fear, suspicion, and paranoia? Forgive me for how I've behaved out of those fears. Would you forgive others who have hurt me And Lord, I commit myself to acting out of faith. I will no longer act out of these fears. Lord, would you help me to see when I'm being fearful? And put a check in me before I act out. Um, I commit my life to you. If there's anything evil, that's coming through acting out of fear. I want nothing to do with you. Leave me and never touch me again. And now I'm going to pray for you. In the name of Jesus, let the power of fear and the spirit of fear be broken off of every person in this room. Any spirit of fear, suspicion, uh, any spirit of, of jealousy and paranoia, 
leave now. Let your power be broken from this day forward. Never touch them again. Go. Uh, how many of you felt something when we prayed that? Yeah, a few of you. All right, I want you to pray again. Uh, Lord, would you forgive me from participating in occult practices? Uh, Lord, I promise to never do that again. Would you forgive uh, my, my parents, my grandparents, and my ancestors of any kind of occult practice? If there's anything evil that's come in through this practice, leave me now and never touch me again. Now I'm going to pray. In the name of Jesus, I command any spirit of divination, uh, any medium, any spiritist, any spirit of witchcraft, any occult spirit or any dark spirit that's come in through those practices, leave now and never touch these people again. Let your power be broken. Go. Be healed and made whole. Any part of their lives where darkness has afflicted them, let it be healed. All evil spirits, leave this place and never touch these people again. You are not allowed to touch their children or their uh, offspring. Go. Let the power of the Lord Jesus come and rid every dark thing out of this room. Be free from this affliction once and for all. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. How many of you felt something just now when I prayed that? Anybody start shaking? A little bit? Okay, I'm going to encourage you to do this. I know that we, there's probably a lot more things to pray through, um, but I highly recommend that if, if you don't feel fully free from some of this or there's some other things, you kind of go, I need to pray through that. Uh, let's make sure that we hit the ministry teams later tonight. Does that sound good? Yeah. And, and if you're thinking, there's going to be people around. I don't want to do it tonight. Uh, find me. Um, make an appointment. Uh, I have people that I've walked through this with and, and trained, and they help me. I'd be happy to, um, to pray with you and to meet with you. Um, another thing is that if you are interested in more of this, um, I've been talking about teaching this. Uh, again. I've taught it a couple times in my church with just some people, but I'll have an open teaching of this. It'll probably be four weeks, midweek. If you're interested in that, I put a piece of paper uh, on the desk on the way out. You can just put you on the left, left-hand left side, you can just put your name and your email address, and I'll contact you with that. It might not be till the first of the year, just because things get crazy, but uh, I'd be happy to, to have you there. If you go to my church, you don't have to put your name there because you'll hear the announcements at church. But if you don't go to my church and you want to par- be a part of that, uh, you can sign up there. I was going to um, mention one last little thing. Um, I'm out of the Overcomer journals. I only brought so many with me. Um, but if you are one of those that has a similar story to myself, or you just have a habitual way of thinking uh, that you know that needs to change, uh, I highly recommend the journal to you. You can order them online. They're at overcomersjournal.com. Uh, um, I will say this. You don't actually need the journal to get free. Okay? It's probably, I'm not a great salesman on that one. Um, <laughs> Uh, you don't actually need the journal, but I do find it to be a helpful prompt to ask you the right questions that you may need to ask yourself so that you can identify some of those underlying beliefs that we have. So you can find those on the website, uh, overcomersjournal.com. Yeah, so find us uh, after the session tonight. Find the prayer team, and, uh, and if not, sign up there. Talk to me individually, um, and we'll go from there. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I just pray in the Holy Spirit to anybody who had anything leave in those instances, we pray that the Holy Spirit would fill it, fill that space, fill that place. That the house is swept clean, but now it is filled. It is not empty. It is swept clean, but not empty. So, Father, fill them with your spirit, with the spirit of peace where there was anxiety, with the spirit of joy where there was fear with the Spirit of God where there was occultic spirits. Father, you fill, you do your good work. 
In Jesus' name, amen.